Last week we spoke about encountering Christ uh, in the church. What does it mean for us to have an encounter with Him? We said that it's, it's about moving beyond uh, the motions, going past just doing the motions. It's not about philosophizing. It's not about having discussions and talks. But encountering Christ is this deep, personal, intimate connection, relation that we have with Him. And that we, we said uh, that, in fact, one of the ways that our relationship with Him is authenticated is the way that we live our lives. It's our lifestyle, right? Said so that our uh, walk authenticates our talk. It's not the other way around, yes? So this week, what I really want to speak about is our uh, spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. So assuming we've encountered Christ, assuming we have a relationship with Him, what should our life look like? There's a story that I shared uh, several months ago uh, during one of the gospel sermons. I'll, I'll share it uh, this morning for those uh, who didn't hear it. But it was about a young boy who had some perhaps unspiritual gifts that he uh, had used um, to get what he wanted. So there was this young boy, he, walks, uh, he was walked by this barber shop. And these two uh, gentlemen were sitting inside, and uh, the barber and one of his buddies, and the guy, he looks out and he says, hey, uh, hey man, my, my, th this kid who's out there, uh, you gotta see he's the dumbest kid in the entire world. And the guy goes, why? He says, every time, every time he walks in here, I put a dollar one hand and two quarters in the other hand. And uh, he always takes the quarters. And so sure enough, the little boy walked in, the guy pulls out a dollar bill and two quarters, and the little kid walks up, takes two quarters, and walks out and goes about his way. And the guy says, see, I told you, he's the dumbest kid in the world. About 30 minutes later, little boy walks by and he's sitting outside down the end of the, the strip and the, the friend walks out from the, his buddy's barber shop. He looks down, he sees the little kid, he says to him, hey, got a question for you. He goes, why do you always take the two quarters instead of the dollar? And he goes, look mister, if I take the dollar, as he licks his ice cream, he says, the game will be over. So he always takes the 50 cents so that the man will continue to do it, okay? We'll continue to play the game with him. The kid had learned a behavior uh, and he used his unspiritual gift, if you will, to get what he wanted from this man. I believe each of us have certain learned behaviors, certain experiences and talents, but we also, in addition, have certain gifts that we have been equipped or given by God. And I believe every one of us has a gift that we've received, and every one of us has a gift to offer. And every seed, no matter how big or small, is valuable. I don't know if you all remember during the, uh, the, the, the fundraising campaign that we were, had in 2017 called Putting Down Roots. I shared with you all that some, like several hundred people had donated. We had raised half a million dollars in 30 days. Uh, seven different countries, three different continents. I think 31 states were represented. And I believe every gift that was given, including not only there was one person gave very generous, like se tens of thousands of dollars, and one person who gave a little kid who had given a bag of his change of like $17, okay? Little kid collected all his money, like six or seven year old kid, Every seed counts, every gift counts. But what I really want to talk about this morning is not financial gifts. It's about the spiritual gifts that we have received. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the household, to the household of the believers or the family of believers. We are told we each have been given some gift, we've been received some things, and what St. Paul is telling us as he's speaking to the Church of Galatia is that we should not resist doing good to others. That if we've received something, we should use it to bless others. And he actually emphasizes, especially those of the household or the family of God. So in fact, yes, we should be a blessing to the world outside, but in fact, we also should, very importantly, he says, especially, we should bless one another. 
And this is one of the, 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 the defining principles of our spiritual gift. The spiritual gift is given to edify or build up the church. When we've received something from God as a spiritual gift, it's given so that we can experience Him more fully, but that we can also bless other people. And that's the main principle I want to share this morning, is that God gives us gifts that will illuminate us and bless others. When God gives us something, He gives it to us so that we can experience Him more personally and more fully. So that we would be illuminated. But in addition, He gives it so that we might bless others. What's the great command? What's the great command? Love who? Love God and love your neighbor. Right? And we spoke a few weeks ago how these two things are two sides of the same coin. So when we've received a gift, it's so that we might know God more, but also that we might bless others more as well. That we might love God more, but also that we might love neighbor more. Also, when we were going through the Advent series, we talked about the Hebrew word ahava, and we said the Hebrew word ahava means to love, and it's an act of being. It's an act of being, right? And we said that the root of the word ahava was the word ahav, which means to give. To give. God is the ultimate gift giver. God so loved the world, we said that He gave His only begotten Son. And in so doing, He gives us not just that great gift of eternal life, but every other gift that comes along with it. When we receive gifts, it's to be experienced, we said, and to share, to, 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 to build up the church, that the church might be edified. I want to speak specifically about what it means that we might experience and share gifts in the body of Christ in the church. And the idea that I want to just mention is the idea of blessing within Catholicity. Catholicity. We've all heard of the, the, the Catholic church. What does the word Catholic mean? What does Catholic mean? Anyone? Universal. That's how it's usually translated, okay? It's universal. But there's uh, probably a more encompassing word for the word Catholic, which is all-encompassing, okay? All-encompassing, okay? So the word Catholic actually means all-encompassing. It's oftentimes translated as universal. Uh, and what it really denotes is totality or integrity. So that there's a an inner totality or an inner integrity within that specific body. This does not mean a mere geographical location. So when we say that the church is universal or Catholic, we're not saying that it's geographically, universally, that's where the church is. There's a much fuller meaning behind it. There's two aspects of it. There's a qualitative aspect and a quantitative aspect. The quantitative aspect is this idea that the church is universal, that it's in all places. But qualitatively, what that means is that the church is Catholic because it encompasses the truth. It beholds the truth. Yes? And so when St. Paul says, test every spirit, and we're going to talk about this idea of the spiritual gifts that we've received, that they should be there, they're given for the blessing of all within the church, but they need to also qualitatively be true. And so this idea of testing the spirits and making sure that what we've received is true and authentic is something that the early church spoke about. And St. Paul specifically addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He actually, in his uh, catechetical lecture, number, what is that, 18, he kind of, it's really beautiful, he, he explains the church as Catholic. This is a, uh, a, a bishop in Jerusalem in the middle of the fourth century, okay? And he describes the church as Catholic and he actually lays out how the church is both qualitatively, right, it's true in itself, it's, it's, there's integrity in what the church is and does, and quantitatively that it's for the sake of all of humanity. That God so loved the, the, the world, right? So the church is called Catholic because it is spread throughout the world from end to end of the earth. Is that speaking about qualitative or quantitative? It's quantitative, right? 
it's spread throughout the world from end to end of the earth, right? It's for all humanity in all places, yes? This is quantitative. Also because it teaches universally and completely all the doctrines which man should know concerning things visible and invisible, heavenly and earthly, and also because it subjects to right worship. Qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative, Qualitative right? It's about truth. It's saying that the doctrines are there, the doctrines are there, and it holds those doctrines to be true, and it has right worship, okay? So that's where the notion of orthodoxy comes from, right? Orthodoxy is right belief, right worship, okay? The next part, he says, all mankind, rulers and ruled, lettered and unlettered. Who is, who is he speaking about here? He's talking about the elites and the simple folks, or the, the, the peasants, if you will, the rulers and the ruled, and the lettered and unlettered. Who is he talking about here? Uneducated, right? If you have letters after your name, you have uh, uh, any letters after it, it's because you've gone on, you've got degrees, right? So he's saying that this is for all people. This is not something for super intelligent people or for just the simple-minded. It is for everyone and everyone in between, right? This is for all. It's Catholic in that it has truth, but that truth is for all of humanity. Further, because it treats and heals universally every sort of sin. This is quantitative, right? It's for every type of sin. You can't come and say, well, there's certain sin that it, it doesn't work for me. You don't know about this sin. And the church is there that we might experience the healing of Christ within it. Committed by the soul and body possesses in itself every conceivable virtue, whether in deeds, words, or spiritual gifts of every kind. So the Catholic Church, the Church is Catholic because it also has within it spiritual gifts of every kind so that those spiritual gifts might be used how? For the healing of every sin. Are you all with me? Okay. So Saint Cyril here is making it very clear that for the Church to be universal or Catholic, having an inner integrity, that the spiritual gifts that, have, that exist of every kind within the church have to be used for the healing of every sort of sin. You guys with me? Let me step back real quick before we get into the spiritual gifts themselves. Let's talk about the greatest gift. The greatest gift. The greatest gift we believe is the Lord himself. We've talked about it. The God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to us. Joshua chapter 13, verse 14 and 33. We're told really beautifully here that the tribe of Levi, he had given no inheritance. Imagine, imagine that the tribe of Israel is being led into the promised land. And every tribe is getting a certain part of land. And you're the tribe of Levi. And you're saying, I want some land here. And Joshua says, you don't get any land. You get no land. You're saying, I want some material wealth. I want, I want to be rich and famous. I want those things. Joshua says, that's not for you. That's not for you. He's like, I got something better for you. You're saying, better than that? He's saying, I got something much better. He had given no inheritance to them. The sacrifice of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance. Who's their inheritance? God himself. The Lord is our inheritance. He is the greatest gift we can receive. When we come to God, oftentimes we come thinking, okay, I'm going to follow God so that I can get all of these things. Seek first the kingdom and all these things shall be added to you. So people sometimes they try to reverse engineer. I want to get all these things so I'm going to follow God. We can't reverse engineer God, folks, okay? It doesn't work like that, okay? So seek first the kingdom. Everything else will fall into place. Our inheritance is not the other things. It's God himself. Our great gift is not health, wealth, fame, prosperity. It's not those things. Our inheritance, our gift is the Lord himself. That is the greatest gift that we can receive. The tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance as he said to them. What's a spiritual gift? We've received God. 
within us. He is the great gift. And with him comes other stuff. And these spiritual gifts we said are to be used for the sake of the healing of souls. So what is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is a work of the whole of a whole the Holy Spirit given to a member of the church for the illumination and satisfaction of the church. Okay? This gift is given to you and I, or these gifts I should say, are given to you and I so that we might be illuminated, we might see more fully, and our souls, our lives might be satisfied in and by Christ. There's a whole long list of spiritual gifts. This is the encouragement, knowledge, faith, serving, leadership, administration, discernment, mercy, healing, a whole slew of gifts. And each and every one of these things are given to us for the sake that we might know God more fully and be satisfied by Him. That we might be built up by our experience of these things. I want to just mention four things that gifts are not. Four things that spiritual gifts are not. Number one, spiritual gifts are not natural talents. Okay? Spiritual gifts are not natural talents. Every person has natural talents. Everyone. Every human being has natural talents. But not every person alive has spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So spiritual gift is specifically tied to the coming of the Holy Spirit upon us and within us. So not every human has, non-Christians would not have the Holy Spirit inside of them. So they wouldn't have spiritual gifts. However, they would have God-given, all of humanity would have God-given natural talents. So might have a talent of singing. And they may use that talent of singing for the glory of God. They might, but that's not a spiritual gift. Okay? They might have a talent of musical instruments, or of public speaking, or of humor. Some people have a natural talent of sleeping, or of eating, or of annoying others. Okay? With natural talents, we can improve them and we can mature them. We can produce, like we can make them better. So let's say you have a good, you have a beautiful singing voice. You can work on that. You can mature that voice as a natural talent that you've been given by God. That each person's been equipped with different talents and you can mature those things. You can work on it and refine it. Number two is that a spiritual gift is not the fruit of the spirits. So love, for instance, love is a fruit of the spirits, a characteristic of the spirit of God dwelling inside of each of us. So for instance, what we're saying here is that fruit of the spirit is the nature of God, who God is, revealed in a person. So if we say God is love, then the fruit, the first one that's listed in the fruit is love. Which means these are for everyone. All Christians are to experience the fruit of the Spirit. I can't just say, well, that's not my characteristic of the fruit. I'm just not a loving person. I can be patient when I need to be, or when I want to be, or when it's convenient, but I'm not a loving person. Okay? I'm not a very kind person, but, you know, I got some other stuff. I got peace inside of me, but I'm not, you know, not kind. Well, it doesn't work like that, right? The fruit of the Spirit is not like, we can't just say, well, I, these three fruit are for me. The others are not. Like spiritual gifts, each of us have different spiritual gifts. Some of us have, may have overlapping gifts. But the fruit of the Spirit doesn't work like that. Number three is that fourth uh, spiritual gift, we have to be careful that it's not a counterfeit gift. What do I mean by a counterfeit gift? Things like fortune telling. Things like um, tarot card reading, things like that, okay? People might be able to tell the future, so to, if, if you will, or pre whether they're doing it in actuality or not, could be through demonic sources, or it, it may be just deception, okay? So a spiritual gift is not a counterfeit gift, and you find that actually in the book of Acts, that there's sorcerers and whatnot, they tried to, they wanted to like depict different, 
types of things that represented the gifts. And actually, during the time of Moses as well, if you all remember, Pharaoh, he had his magicians who would come and they would do forfeit type acts that mirrored or mimicked the works that God was doing through Moses. And number four is that a spiritual gift is not a Christian role. So being a bishop is not a spiritual gift, that's a role. Okay? As a priest, that's not a gift that I've been given, that's a role that I have in the church. A deacon the same. Lay persons, that's not a gift, that is a role, that's an office that you have in the church. Just as a reminder, as lay people, there is a, there's an office, there's a role that you have in the church. These are roles, but they're not gifts, so to speak. Okay? I want to go through very quickly six principles of gifts. Number one is that God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. If you have your Bibles, you can look with me in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. St. Paul says the following, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, with him, and if you're in your Bibles, you can underline the word with him, also freely give us all things. What we're being told here is that all things that will be given will be given with him. That he is the gift, and that other gifts come along with him. The with him is the, the key that's there. Okay? That these gifts that come, come along with Christ. And in James chapter 1, verse 17, every good and every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. What makes a gift a good gift? Every good gift and every perfect gift. What makes a gift a good gift? What, what makes it good? A gift from God. What makes it a good gift? The word good here, it implies usefulness. Usefulness. Okay? When he says good gift, the word in Greek implies it's a useful gift. It's something that will benefit others. A good Christian, we would say, is not a good Christian because they go to church or because they sit at home and read their Bible alone. But a good Christian, we'd say, is a good Christian because they make themselves useful for the sake of the kingdom of building up others. What makes a, a gift a perfect gift? Perfect here denotes maturity, completeness, wholeness. Not lacking, it's developed. Okay? When we refer to Saint Bishoy in the, in the commemoration of saints, we refer to him as, as the good and perfect man, right? The perfect man. In Arabic, it's el ragil el kamil. El ragil means the man. El kamil means the perfect or the complete. The complete, okay? So when we say he's the el ragil el kamil or the perfect man, what we're saying is he is mature, He's complete. He's lacking nothing in his development as a Christian. And so spiritual gifts are the same. The gifts that we've received from God, they're there. They're perfect. They're lacking nothing in themselves. We can't add to them. We can't mature the gifts from God because they come from Him. They're not a work of the, the flesh. We can certainly partner with Him, but they are complete. They're mature in themselves. For sure, our experiences will partner with the gifts, but we don't add and make the gifts better. Rather, God will use our successes and our hurts and partnership with the gifts to reach different people. You may have spiritual experiences where you've had mean, meaningful decisions, times with God in your life, times that you especially felt close to God, and he will take those experiences in partnership with a gift, whether it's the gift of mercy, the gift of evangelism or preaching, the gift of teaching, the gift of knowledge, the gift of hospitality, and he'll use those experiences in partnership with the gifts to help you serve and build others 
up. Because the truth is, we can all, or several of us, four or five of us could have the same gifts, but our experiences allow us to uniquely express that gift to a diversity or a multiplicity of, of people. Okay? And the same goes, by the way, for painful experiences. Every one of us in this room has had hurts, we've had problems, we've had trials in our lives, we've had difficulties, we've had, we have carried around scars and wounds. And God can take the spiritual gifts in partnership with those experiences that He's sanctifying and use those to bless other people. Once again, that goes the same for our educational experiences and our experiences serving or ministering to other. Number two is gift receiving should lead to, lead to gift giving. Freely received, freely give. Freely received, freely give. Uh, several years ago, this must have been about four years ago now, my kids, uh, the twins were five at the time, so don't hold this against them. Uh, they were, Joseph had come to me and he told me, Grace won't share her bouncy balls with me, okay? And uh, so I said, Grace, how many, how many bouncy balls do you have? And I'm thinking she's gonna say like two or three. She looks at me and she goes, um, I have 14, I have 14, right? She, I'm like, and I started laughing and I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like you have 14 bouncy balls and you won't share one? She's like, well, every one of them is unique and I need them, right? She's matured beyond that. Thanks be to God. But when we receive, the expectation is, man, we have all of this stuff in front of us want to bless other people with it. Last week we talked, I believe in Luke chapter 12, about the man who had that huge bump crop. And rather than, he already had a barn full of, of crop. And he, rather than taking the huge bump crop that had come in and distributing it to others, what did he do? He tore down his barn, built an even bigger one, and collected it all. He said, now I'm going to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And if you all remember last week when we read it, as Christ is telling the, 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 the parable, he says, then God said to him, you fool, whose things will these be after you go, after you die? He says, today your soul will be accounted for. When, when we receive, freely we receive, freely we should, we should give. One of the major themes in the Bible is the idea of giving. It's the idea of giving. And if you all remember during the, the Advent series, we talked about the connection between the two different types of gifts, right? We said that there's the gift that God gives to us, which is translated as charisma, or from the word charisma. Um, it's where we get the word charis, like grace, right? Charis or char charisma. So God gives us gifts, and how do we respond? What do we give back to Him? We give back to Him different types of gifts. The word is doron, right? Theodor toedros, like gift of God, right? So He gives us gifts, and what do we do? We respond by giving God and others gifts in response. Freely we've received, freely give. So what happens here? What happens here? There's a response for each one of these, right? God gives us charisma, gift, and we respond with joy, chara. Yes? God gives us charisma, a gift, and we respond with thanksgiving, efcharisteya. There's a connection here. And all of this, by the way, has to do with the word grace. Because it's all coming from God. And we're responding to God because He freely gives us. And so what, like what can we do but respond? So when He gives us gifts, guys, we respond joyfully, we respond with thanksgiving to God, and we respond in the same way to others. We say, I come offering you, like we actually say in the liturgy, we give to you from what you've given to us, or from what is yours. Number three, number three. Oftentimes we think of gifts there being a hierarchy. And I want to I wanna dismantle that idea. First of all though, hierarchy does not denote greater value. Hierarchy does not denote greater value. 
hierarchy when we speak about an importance or a value of a certain gift or role, it does not denote that there's, that role is more important. What's more important during a liturgy? Having a priest, a deacon, or a lay person? What's more important? All three. You can't have a liturgy without at least one priest, one deacon, and one lay person. You can't. Like in the, in, the, in the Orthodox Church, we can't do that. So when we refer to things hierarchically or we imagine them, it's based on our temporal needs. But when we talk about spiritual gifts, there's not one gift that's more valuable or more important than other. What's more important in the church? Preaching and teaching or hospitality when someone walks in? What's more important? You can't have, yeah, they're both equally important. What happens if we have the greatest teaching in the world, but people are rude and jerks or un and unhospitable when someone walks in? People aren't gonna wanna come. They're not gonna experience like the embrace and the love and the warmth of a hospital. And the healing rather of a hospital. Hospitals are not usually warm, okay? But they, they're not gonna receive the healing of a hospital if we're not hospitable. But what if we're the most hospitable people, but we're teaching false doctrine? Then people's souls will be negatively affected. I mean, the warmest people in the world. But if there's false doctrine being taught, if there's heresy being taught, then it actually will lead people astray from following the truth of Christ. St. John Chrysostom, he actually, uh, he had suggested that the most basic task of the church leaders to discern the spiritual gift of all those under his uh, authority or responsibility and to encourage these gifts to be used for the full uh, benefit of all. That's the, the primary responsibility of the church leaders, to look and say, like help people understand and discern what's your spiritual gift and how can you use that gift for the edification or the building up of all, okay? Number four, number four. Disciples of Jesus are zealous for the edification of the entire church. Which means Disciples of Christ are not focused on ego, are not focused on self. They're not focused on who's getting credit for what. They're simply concerned with building up the body of Christ. Who gets the credit shouldn't make a difference. Actually, one of the priests said something very, very insightful. He said, everyone is willing to work on something until someone is going to get the credit. And then either one of two things usually happens. People will step away or people will fight to see who's going to get credit. And I thought, I'm like, that's really, really insightful. But in the body of Christ, no one's concerned with who gets credit or it, the, the zeal that one has is to say, I want to see the body of Christ grow, to be edified, to be nourished, to be built up. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 tells us that the diversity of gifts in each of us is for the, the common good, the common good. And in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8 to 12, just want to read this passage. He says, St. Paul says, For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the word, the tongue, words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many different kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Be zealous for spiritual gifts, and let it be for the edification of the church that you may excel, that you seek to excel. St. Mary, one of her, uh, we speak about her role as Theotoke, the Theotokos, the mother of God, but one of what she did, um, I believe, in some, some respects, she was, she was an evangelist. Uh, but she was an evangelist with few words. Her life really preached the gospel. And we say this in the Theotokeia, the, the Sunday Theotokeia. It's one of the hymns. It says, you too, O Mary, are clothed with the glory of the divinity within and without. And you've brought unto God your son many people through your purity. It's through her encounter with God that we spoke about last week that this 
the Holy Spirit comes upon her and her life of purity begins to be a message that draws people onto God her son right the whole focus here is on the edification of of the church it's building others up principle number five the value of a gift is maximized when it's exercised with love and that, that that's really the point that Saint Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. If you guys remember in chapter 12, he's talking about, like he actually tells them, be zealous, pursue spiritual gifts. And then in chapter 13, he turns the entire chapter to love. And he says, but there's one, like there's a better way. And then he talks about pursuing love, and love is patient, love is kind. And we know this chapter because everyone wants to put this chapter on their wedding invitations, and their engagement invitations, and it's love is patient. I think it's 1 Corinthians 13a. I mean, we love this chapter. And then he transitions to chapter 14, back to spiritual gifts. And what he's saying here is this. When we pursue and use spiritual gifts, they are maximized when we exercise or use them through a lens of love. If we simply have and pursue spiritual gifts, and this is what was happening in the Church of Corinth. Church of Corinth, they were pursuing spiritual gifts because they presumed some spiritual gifts would be, help them stand out. And they wanted to stand out. Why not? The ego says, you should stand out. And what St. Paul's saying here is, pursue love above all else. Because with love, if you love God and love neighbor, you're not seeking your own. You're simply taking the gift that you've received and using it for the benefit of the entire body of Christ. The ego, as we heard in today's gospel, St. John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. It wasn't about him. It was always pointing others to Christ. Number six. Number six. Serving others will reflect the life of Jesus through yours. Should always reflect the life of Jesus through yours. Whenever we have a spiritual gift and we're using it, should always point others to Jesus. Jesus, he would wash the feet of the disciples. Like we don't, we don't look at Christ and say, wow. And the words of Jesus Christ are profound. They're not like, you don't read them and be like, that's a really hard saying. Like, it's not like when you read, like if you read Aristotle or Plato, you're like, dude, like that's some crazy stuff. The words of Christ are simple, yet profound. They're paradoxical at times. But what distinguishes Christ was his life. The life he lived fully in obedience to the Father and for his love for humanity. He gave himself as a gift to us. When we think about our own lives fully lived, it's less so about the words that we speak and more so about the way that we serve one another and we give our, ourselves away to Christ and by so doing we give ourselves away to his bride, the church. If I am saying, I give myself to Christ, then what am I also saying? I'm, who am I also giving myself to? I'm giving myself to the church. The church is his bride, folks. The church, unfortunately, we oftentimes look at the church through this very like secular view of it. And we say, well, it's just an organization and this is the structure. And we want to describe it structurally because that's what we do in the West. We want to define it based on the way that we perceive it temporally. But the truth is, when we look at the church, we should see the beautiful bride of Christ that has, <laughs> has certainly its imperfections, but that has been washed and cleansed and built up by the ministry of Christ through the saints who are continuing to work today in the church. I want to, just as a point of wrap up, pose the question, because I believe that uh, we have a we have a, 
a bit of an issue in the church. I want to say the church. I'm now not talking about St. Annas. I'm not even just talking about the Coptic Church in New Jersey. I'm not just talking about the Coptic Church in the world. I'm talking about in the church throughout the world, no matter what denomination one ascribes to. And I think the problem that exists in the church, in general, is that we have a bunch of people that walk into church <clears throat> as consumers. What can church do for me? What can this church do for me? What am I going to get from this church? If even half the people do that, what ends up happening? What ends up happening is this. I want you to imagine like this half of the room are the people who come and say, I'm going to actively serve in the church. And this half of the church is the side that says, we're not, like we're just here to receive. We just want to consume. What happens? The church is not running and functioning at full optimum, like at a full optimum level. Why? Because this group of the church does not have every spiritual gift accounted for. This side of the church doesn't have all the experiences of Christ summed up in and of itself. But if the entire body is working together and taking the spiritual gifts that they've received from God, first exploring those and using those, then what happens is the entire church is being built up. And it's not the 10% serving the 90% or the 5% serving the 95%, but it's the 100% serving the 100%. And then the beauty of what happens at that point is it then begins to overflow naturally out of the walls of the church. Because you just can't contain it. Because there's so much gifting and grace and love and, and, and the Spirit of God begins to like overflow, figuratively speaking here, folks, okay? But it begins to overflow out of the walls of the church and out of the lives of the church because we then are all filled by God's presence between us. And when this person over here is having a rough day and walks in, the people with gift of hospitality look and they go over to that person, they embrace them, they love them. And when someone's going through a difficult day, a person with gifts of ministry, mercy would go and extend God's mercy to them and remind them. And when this person over here is hearing, like having some confused thoughts, people with the gifts of knowledge or teaching or wisdom would be able to go and give them sound doctrine and good advice and Christian counsel. And so it's not falling on the shoulders of one person or on 5%, but it's the entire church is using experiences and talents that are perfected by the gifts of God for the building up of the entire church. All glory to God forever. Amen.